Okay. The Paramount City Council is now called to order. May I have roll call of council members, please? Council Member Gian? Here. Council Member Hoffmeyer? Here. Council Member Lemons? Here. Vice Mayor Hansen? Here. Mayor Martinez? Here. At this time, I'd like my colleagues to join me at the podium. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, we have a few public presentations, two of which are a continuation of our celebration of education in Paramount. If any of the following are here, please join us in front. From the Paramount Unified School District, President Vivian Hansen, Vice President Sonia Cuellar, Board Member Alicia Anderson, Board Member Linda Garcia, Board Member Tony Pena, and also Superintendent Dr. Ruth Perez. If there are any members of the Paramount Education Partnership Board of Directors, please join us as well. Oh, wonderful. Good, Glenn. Yay. During the annual Penny. Thank you. During the annual Pennies for Pep fundraiser in March, Dr. Perez and the wonderful team at Paramount Unified School District bought in $122,000 for the PEP Scholarship Fund. At this time, I'd like to um, bring up Board Member Linda Garcia. Tonight, we are recognizing the individual schools that were most successful at the fundraising. They will be receiving a Pennies for PEP piggy bank to display at their schools. Would each principal please join us as I call your name and your school? In the $5,000 club, we have Lincoln School Principal Topeka Jones and Hollydale Principal Lisa Nunley McComb. <laughs> please join us in front. The 10,000 club consists of a laundry principal, Lynn Butler, and Zamboni principal, Sue Sakali. The lone member of the $20,000 club is Paramount Park Principal Kevin Longworth. <laughs> and the $30,000 club belongs to Jackson School Principal Kelly Anderson. <laughs> Jackson, in fact, Jackson, in fact, was once again the overall top, top fundraiser in the district, donating an amazing $35,970. For this milestone, they will receive championship t-shirts, a staff dinner party, and a field day of fun for the students. We also have a piggy bank for the ultimate club, the $100,000 club for the district itself, which would go to Dr. Perez. Is Dr. Perez present? Okay. Oh, she's on her way. Okay. Okay, let's hand it to our board president, Vivian Hansen. Thank you. There were a number of special events and creative avenues again this year to encourage donations across the district. For example, there was March Madness, with brackets and winners moving forward, like the college basketball playoffs. I heard the competition between schools could get pretty aggressive, but in a fun way and for a good cause. The winner of March Madness this year was, can you guess, Jackson School Principal Anderson. <laughs> For your 
victory, here is a special championship belt. <laughs> Later this year, the staff will get a taco lunch and the students will have an ice cream day. While we highlight the schools tonight that attracted the most donations, everyone in the district who gave any amount deserves special thanks and, and appreciation. Pennies for Pep produces real excitement on our campuses about the idea of going to college. It's a great advertisement for higher education. So at this time, we are going to take a photo. Hi, Dr. Perez. It's all right. You made it. We're starting a new tradition this year for Education Month. A few years ago, the city created our Boulevard of Heroes to honor residents who are serving in the military. In fact, the same spirit, we have now formed our Boulevard of Scholars to recognize another group of Paramount's finest. Banners featuring the top 25 college-bound seniors from Paramount High School based on their GPAs would be featured on a laundry between Lakewood Boulevard and Paramount Boulevard. I'm going to pause. We have another school board member who just joined us. Um, board member Tony Pena, please come forward. Okay. This. <laughs> this will be a yearly acknowledgement. The banners have the student's senior photo and their college destination and will be displayed into the summer. Tonight, we are giving each student a miniature version of their banner as a memento. So, if you were able to make it this evening, please come forward when I mention your name and school. Cesar Arzete, UCLA. Mari Carmen U Ayala, UCLA. <laughs> Humberto Brenna, Cal State Long Beach. <laughs> Adelis Burgos, UCLA. <laughs> Angel Macias, Santa Clara University. Guadalupe Marquez, UC Irvine. Yeah. 
Joanna Martinez, UC Irvine. <laughs> Vanessa McCoy, Cal Lutheran University. <laughs> Diego Mejia, University of Nebraska. Edward Mendoza, UC Irvine. <laughs> Jocelyn Merez, Cal Poly Pomona. <laughs> Melissa Montoya, UC Santa Barbara. <laughs> Amanda Munoz, UCLA. <laughs> Omar Munoz, UC Irvine. <laughs> Carla Navarro, UCLA. <laughs> Brianna Paz, UC Berkeley. <laughs> Chloe Fanu Thong, UC Irvine. Delilah Pineda, UCLA. <laughs> Fernando Corona Riso, Duke University. <laughs> Larissa Robles, UC Davis. <laughs> Daniela Sanchez, UC Irvine. <laughs> Adrian Titano, UC Irvine. Alexis Torres, Stanford. <laughs> Brianna Villaverde, UC Irvine. <laughs> and Yen Wu, UC San Diego. <laughs> Congratulations on your great achievements. Good luck in your new ventures, and thank you for representing Paramount so well.
And now I'd like and now I'd like you to meet some other exceptional students from Paramount High School. As I'm sure everyone remembers, a few months ago there was a terrible crash on Downey Avenue adjacent to the high school campus in which four students were badly hurt. It was an awful and frightening scene. And yet it brought out the best in four students who automatically stepped in to help and comfort those that were injured until police and paramedics arrived. We also have with us tonight some of the first responders from the Sheriff's Department and the Fire Department. Please welcome Deputy Hector Sine and Battalion Chief Tony Ramirez, who are here to honor these four students, who in this case were the actual first responders. <laughs> Now would Gabriel Orozco, Anthony Ferraris, Juan Garza, and Fernando Melgar please join us. Are any of you present? 
Okay, well, that's all right. We'll continue. The, okay, these four individuals represent not only the best of Paramount, but the best of the human spirit. Their actions speak of compassion, kindness, and yes, heroism that is a joy to behold. Tonight, in addition to giving them certificates of recognition, we give them our respect and gratitude. At this time, we will have a photo with our guest, please. In 1997, Christopher Cash came to work for our city as a management analyst in the Community Development Department. The next year, he moved over to the Public Works Department, where he eventually became the director in 2007. Over these years, Chris has become a valued member of our staff. I would suggest that our Public Works team is one of the best in the region and it is as important reason why Paramount looks so good and runs so smoothly. Now Chris is leaving us to take over the same department in the city of Orange. They are lucky to have him, as we've been for these many, many years. We have a plaque expressing our appreciation for the great work he has done, and we wish him the best of luck. Chris? Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations to your son. It's a major accomplishment. Yeah, thank you. It'll be hanging up uh, in about a
this time, we'll have City Council public comment updates. Uh, yes, Madam Mayor and Council. Uh, before I do go into that, I'd like to introduce Ms. Karen Feld. She's um, serving as our Assistant City Attorney tonight in place of Mr. John Cavanaugh, who is on vacation uh, this week. So again, Ms. Karen Feld, F-E-L-D, is our Assistant City Attorney. Welcome. So moving on to City Council public comment updates from the May 1st, 2018 meeting, we had Mr. Gerald Serta come to the City Council meeting to address the City Council regarding sidewalk markings that were left by Southern California Edison that were not uh, once again being removed by them. Uh, staff evaluated the, the situation and determined that there are other utility marking companies <laughs> that leave their uh, the, their marks behind in addition to just Edison. So rather than just going to Edison, we're working with the county who issues the permits for um, any type of work in the public right away. And we're asking the county to include in the permit that the markings have to be removed as a condition of the permit um, that is issued to contractors before the work is, I mean, after the work is completed. So we're, again, working with the county on that. So it would affect Edison, the gas company, uh, spectrum cable, anybody that has to mark the lines. And again, this is a safety issue. Uh, they're required by state law to do the markings, mm -hmm. but there's nothing that requires uh, the contractors to remove the, the markings once the work is completed. So um, we're again, we're hoping to work with the county and have that done. Thank you. Are there any public comments? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we have one from Ms. Sarah Patricia Wieso, and Ms. Wieso would like to discuss with the council about issues. <coughs> Ms. Wieso? Good evening, council members. Good evening. Um, I wanted to make a comment regarding the new um, remodeling of the city hall. It looks good, Thank but you. it seems to me, and I don't know, it just might be my perception that there's less seats than there were. So I just wanted to make a comment regarding that. Um, also, I wanted to mention that the trees that were planted um, with the 2.0 um, Amigos de los Rios um, project. There's a couple of them in the city that are dry. I don't know that they were maybe properly um, put in place because some of them are drying out and I think some of them are dead. So you guys might want to take a look at that. Thank you for bringing that to our okay. attention. Thank you. Um, um, hey, Madam Mayor, just to, if, I can, if I may, um, the number of seats have not changed, both on this, the staff level as well as the, uh, the audience level. Any other public comments? No, ma'am. Okay, consent calendar, please. Move it. Second. <coughs> Roll call, please. Councilmember Guillen? Yes. Councilmember Hoffmeyer? Yes. Councilmember Lemons? Yes. Vice Mayor Hanson? Yes. Mayor Martinez? Yes. Item five, oral report, City Council Chambers improvement. Staff report, please. Uh, yes, Madam Mayor and Council, after a short absence, it feels good to be back in the Council Chambers once again for both, I would imagine for you, but uh, definitely for staff. We don't have to set up everything at Progress Plaza like we had to do for the last few meetings. Um, as you know, for the last couple of months, we've been installing all new AV equipment and making minor interior improvements here in the Council Chambers um, at the <coughs> Council's direction to allow for video recording and live streaming of our Council meetings. So as you'll hear from Kevin in a little bit, the vast majority of this project has been paid for through grant funds. Uh, the old AV system we had in here was over 20 years old and it was a bit tired. Uh, the improvements that we made, it actually integrates the latest technology and allows for the modern forms um, of media to broadcast our, our me meetings for. So uh, we also improve the experience of the community, community members who attend our meetings as well with new art around the building. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kevin, who will handle the item. Kevin. Thanks, John. Good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the City Council, and welcome to your newly renovated City Council Chambers. As I'm sure you've already noticed, uh, we've made some changes that are very obvious and some that aren't quite as readily apparent. Uh, but before going into the improvements, uh, first a little bit about the process that we had. Um, this was about a three-month construction project that we started in March, and we hope to be completely wrapped up by the end of this month. The overall project was funded through public educational and government, or PEG, access funds that the city receives through its franchise with Spectrum Cable TV. These are funds that may only be used to help make government information and programming accessible to the public. 
no general fund monies were used for this project. The city used three different contractors to perform the work to complete the project. One contractor was for the physical improvements, one for um, audio visual enhancements, and another for installing the video recording equipment. And this was a joint project between the public works and administrative services departments. In terms of the physical improvements, you can see that the dais has been reconfigured from a semi-square to a U-shaped layout. This reconfiguration will allow for a better and more open presentation area and seating positions for some staff members so they can now sit without having their backs to the audience um, and the camera. We installed a new microphone system, which you can tell is pretty audible and sensitive. Um, new lighting fixtures, um, video monitors, and we also replaced the staff chairs. I'm sure you noticed the very large and clear new 90-inch TVs that were installed. Of course, these replaced the, um, the one antiquated rear projection screen that we had on the left side of the wall, um, and um, that didn't always have the clearest image and was often hard to see. Now that we have one TV on each side, audience members will now have a better view of presentations without any obstruction. We also painted the walls, recarpeted, <clears throat> installed a very nice city logo behind the dais there, and we replaced the artwork around the chamber with new photos and historic images. In the area behind the audience, you'll notice that we installed a new booth for our computer operator, as well as our Spanish translator. We also improved the area just outside of the chambers, which is directly behind me, that allows for ADA compliant access to um, our conference room here in the back. Previously, you'll remember, um, there was a step that might have prevented some members of the public from accessing that conference room. In terms of the AV and video recording improvements, you can see the new video camera installed uh, behind the audience at the top of the wall, and that's there. Um, the camera can zoom in and out and can pan around and is controlled remotely through a new broadcast studio that we also constructed, which is behind the dais in the back room. Uh, we also have a new AV system control that will be operated from the booth that I just mentioned. To, um, and uh, we will also be integrating a presentation touchpad system to allow staff to point on their presentation so that audience members um, and those watching on TVs or on their computers um, can see what's being pointed at and I'll demonstrate real quickly what that will look like. So uh, as you can see on your screen as and the audience can see on the two big TVs, uh, we have this controller which can now, where we can um, point to things and, and talk mm -hmm. and we can um, highlight <coughs> what specifically we're talking about as part of um, our presentation. And then we can <laughs> erase that and change a different color if we need to. So it's just a way to make it more clear <coughs> for those watching at home or those here um, in the council chambers. And if I may interject, uh, Kevin, excuse me, we'll have four of those pads up here spread around for staff and also have one up here for council because there have been times where I've noticed that if there's something on your screen like a map or something and you want to point to something, nobody's really able, the, 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 the presenter's not able to really see what you are, so if, what you're pointing at. So I'll give the iPad to you and you can just point it, it'll peer it up and everybody can see what you're, you're referring to. So. <clears throat> And we also worked with uh, Spectrum to install a new fiber optic line that's coming into City Hall that will be necessary for broadcasting City Council meetings um, live on cable TV. With all of this new equipment, the City will now be able to record City Council meetings on its own. As you know, we've been temporarily <coughs> using the services of Ron Roberson to help with the recording process and now the video production will all be done in-house. The new equipment will let us live stream city council meetings online on the city's YouTube channel and on the city's Spectrum Cable TV channel. And the archived meeting videos will continue to be available on YouTube, um, the city's website, and cable TV replays. 
In the previous slide, I mentioned the fiber optic line from Spectrum. As the city is now responsible for managing its cable TV channel, the new fiber optic line will allow the city to upload a variety of programs such as city council meetings, city events, and other public service announcements onto the channel for public viewing. And finally, we will also be purchasing our own equipment for Spanish translation use during city council meetings. Before, we had to rent this equipment from our interpreter, so this will now help with some cost savings. And so we did a test run of the new video recording equipment last week during our planning commission meeting. Um, this short video snippet of the uh, planning commission meeting is an example of how the video will look like um, to those watching the city council meetings on their computers or on cable TV. And it will show how the video transitions from the meeting to presentations and then back. The system worked pretty well and uh, it was pretty easy to operate by our staff but we're still learning the system and, and uh, learning the ins and outs of that. So um, here we go. And Jonathan, if you can put up the, start the video. I want to call this regular meeting of the- So here, this is a static screen and then we will um, uh, fade into time, the like council meeting. Like the and here you see, uh, it shows the city, city council dais as well as the staff, the two presentation uh, TVs. And then in a moment, you'll see that it'll fade here into a presentation, and this is a direct feed. This is not the camera showing the, um, the slide. This is a direct feed. And then here we transition back to the council meeting. So we can do this throughout um, the meeting with um, you know presentations and such. And when the council is not actually uh, in session or speaking, we'll come back to the static screen. So overall, the project is largely done, and again, we hope to have it completely done by the end of the month. Um, while the meeting, while this meeting is um, being recorded as we normally do with the new system, we won't be ready to live stream on YouTube or broadcast on cable TV until your next meeting on June 5th. Um, and we'll be sure to adver advertise that new feature to our residents through social media, and we'll do that well in advance. So with that, that concludes my presentation. Hopefully you're pleased with the new improvements and I welcome any comments or questions you might have. Thank you. <coughs> Very nice, thank you, Kevin. Mm -hmm. Kevin, with this technology, will we now um, be able to record or live stream the commission meetings, like maybe a planning commission? Um, that would be a decision for the council to make, um, but uh, you know, our, our first, uh, you know, task was to have this ready for city council meetings. So that'd be up to you. In the future, maybe. Yeah. I'm sorry. Maybe in the future, something mm -hmm. we could consider. That's something we can discuss in the future. Any other questions? Okay, item six, all report. May I have a staff report on the Safe, Clean, and Water program, please? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor and Council. As I've been mentioning to you over the last couple of months, the Board of Supervisors, LA County Board of Supervisors, they're in the process of developing a countywide property tax measure that would fund stormwater management. Uh, the proposed measure, uh, if put on the ballot, would be called the Safe, Clean, Water program. Uh, the Board of Supervisors will determine in July whether or not to place this measure on the November 2018 ballot. Um, just as a little bit of background, the, the Federal Clean Water Act requires cities and counties to mitigate and treat stormwater before it goes out into the ocean. However, this responsibility <laughs> comes with a hefty price tag and money that we just don't have, what many cities just don't have that kind of money. So the proposed ballot measure will allow for the collection of tax money to pay for measures to reduce the amount of pollution that goes into the storm drains and out in the ocean. So our guest speaker tonight is Ms. Genevieve Osmega from the LA County Public Works Department, and she'll address for us the latest details, including the latest information on the proposed costs per property that the county is planning. I'll turn it over to Ms. Osmega. Thank you. Yeah, good evening. Good evening. Um, Mayor Martinez and fellow council members, thank you for, um, uh, to Chris and staff here uh -huh. for reaching out uh, to the county to come and give a presentation and some information. Um, so uh, let's see. And again, um, my name is Genevieve. I'm from uh, the department, LA County Department of Public Works. I'm part of the support staff um, that has been involved in helping to develop the, the currently draft proposed program. 
And uh, we have also been assisting with the stakeholder process that has taken place since last fall uh, to hear um, stakeholders' input and comments in terms of their priorities and what they'd like <coughs> to see in the program. So um, I guess before I get into a little bit of the background here with this slide, uh, we do have a very detailed uh, program document um, that has been released to stakeholders that uh, we are uh, receiving public comments on. Um, and after uh, we receive those and compile those, uh, as it was mentioned, uh, we'll finalize that for um, uh, going to our Board of Supervisors to ask for uh, adoption of the uh, resolution and approval to put it on the, the ballot for this November. So uh, what I'll start out with is a couple of years ago, uh, actually in 2016, our board really started talking about the need for funding stormwater, which has been identified um, as kind of the fiscal orphan in terms of water resource management in the region um, as, as a result of uh, several board motions in both uh, 2016 and in uh, the most recent one here in May 2017. Um, uh, it was, uh, there was a rapid assessment that was done that uh, I think it was a known, um, it was one of those things that everybody knew that stormwater um, was this fiscal orphan, but we didn't really have all the data and all the information in one place. And this rapid assessment that was reported back to the Board of Supervisors last year is kind of a brief uh, doc document uh, that sort of tries to collect all the information from um, all the areas of water, water, uh, water supply, uh, storm water, uh, groundwater, and uh, their funding sources and what's needed. And what the board saw is they, they saw the gap in storm water and they really saw the need to provide some regional leadership to kind of bring our region um, and make it water resilient. And so uh, from that, um, we started the stakeholder process and also we um, uh, last fall adopted uh, AB 1180, which was kind of the first step towards developing uh, what is the real purpose of this is uh, to develop a multi-benefit stormwater program and uh, the really the main uh, goals are these three bullets, improve water quality, increase local water supply, and provide community with enhancements and investments uh, to give back to um, our citizens. And the, we know water quality is of utmost importance as it was mentioned with uh, trying to meet all the regulations um, for water quality. We really wanted the program is really designed to make sure that that is a benefit that is um, achieved. But the, the board, along with the stakeholder feedback, really saw that this was an opportunity to provide, uh, to do even more and to provide even additional things. And that's where the other uh, desired program outcomes and increasing um, water supply and also providing community um, improvements came in. So uh, again, with 1180, this is the enacting legislation. This is what, um, and it was adopted last year, it was, uh, this is the le legislation that allows the LA County Flood Control District to amend the current LA County Flood Control Act to, um, to basically impose a tax for the purpose of um, uh, uh, basically uh, to improve stormwater capture for the additional purposes of improving water quality and uh, water supply and community enhancement. Currently, the current Flood Control Act, as it's written, uh, really only gives us authority to um, collect uh, a tax for the purpose of flood control and water conservation. So with that legislation, we have this, it would give this additional authority to um, achieve these additional things with stormwater capture. So um, I think what I'll do here is um, <coughs> the program, again, there is this very detailed document and we've got a website that I'll share, uh, hopefully it, I think it's at the end of this program where we can definitely get more information, but uh, the 1180 legislation is actually prescribing the program be divided up into these three pots um, that would be used to fund these three programs. Um, and what I was going to do is probably, I go a little bit out of order, I was wanting to focus on the municipal program for sure and give you as, um, um, some pretty good details about um, how this program uh, will uh, benefit municipalities um, and how the cities like Paramount would participate. Uh, and then 50, the 50% 50 pot is the regional program. Again, cities would participate with other agencies and other municipalities in, in collaborative efforts uh, to, to do these projects. And then a little bit, I, I'll provide a little bit of information about the 10% pot, which is the district program. 
So um, the municipal program, uh, and I did uh, look it up, with the expected revenue to be generated from this tax, paramount um, is expected revenue is seven, about $700,000 a year would come back to the city of Paramount. Um, and uh, I should have started out with this again. The, the purpose of this program is really to achieve stormwater capture infrastructure pro projects um, and all the um, activities associated with, put, get, with implementing those projects. Uh, and then there's also some money for programs and um, monitoring and other activities uh, associated with achieving uh, those goals. So the $700,000 per year, that would go back to the city. And right now, um, that is 40% of the funds. So basically, uh, all the money that's generated um, within the city, 40% of would go right back to the city. And uh, that $120 million is what's expected for the whole entire uh, region. Um, the total amount for the whole program is $300 million. So the, for, for the purpose of this discussion, um, the total revenue expected is, three, is $300 million. And of that, 120 will go uh, to this initial pro program. So right now, this, this pot of funding is really meant uh, to provide the maximum flexibility back towards cities for them to use uh, and decide how to spend these funds um, uh, as they uh, see fit. We feel that cities know what their priorities are. They know where uh, they need um, uh, the projects. And so there's really only two major requirements for this funding. Uh, one is that the projects uh, must have a water quality benefit. Uh, we're definitely going to encourage that multi-benefit um, types of projects um, and that you work with uh, groups to do these multi-benefit projects. Uh, but it's not required, uh, only a water quality benefit's required. And then the other uh, requirement is that only up to 30% of the funds can be spent on existing activities um, that, uh, that are already in place. And that is really to um, acknowledge that a lot of cities are already doing a lot of things uh, and funding things that are going towards these goals. And uh, while we want um, you know, most of the uh, funding to go towards new activities, <coughs> Um, we are specifying this 30% for existing things. And uh, this is just a few examples of uh, what that could be used for, street sweeping, catch basin cleaning, uh, O&M of existing stormwater capture projects. Uh, I wanna say that um, both the 30 and the 70 um, can also be used to um, fund staff, uh, um, staff time or staff uh, that are doing things that are, um, uh, helping with uh, either managing or overseeing stormwater capture uh, activities. And so, um, so <laughs> before I move on to the, uh, the regional program, I, I really wanted to stress that um, not, in addition to the 40%, uh, this 50% uh, from the regional program is also uh, going to be accessible to cities. So we really feel that you know 90% of the pot is really meant to go back uh, to the cities individually and then cities collaboratively to, um, to work with one another to, uh, to achieve these um, programs and uh, projects and programs. So uh, now a little bit of information about the 50% pot, uh, expected revenue about $150 million. Um, and the main thing I think, um, I want to talk about is that um, the with the governance structure that's proposed right now, there will be about eight or nine of these watershed areas. And again, all the tax revenue that's generated uh, within these watershed areas will go will stay in those watershed areas. And uh, Paramount, it's I think it's the purple blo uh, purple shape underneath. That's a little bit small. I don't know if I can point to it. But um, uh, I believe Paramount is in, uh, it's almost right in between Lower LA and Lower San Gabriel. So uh, Paramount, in partnership with uh, the other cities in those two watershed areas, would have access to both of those pots. I don't have the amounts offhand of what would be generated uh, for the regional program, but um, it's, yeah, it would definitely be participating in both of those groups and have access to both of those groups for the projects um, that the city would have in either of the two watersheds. Um, again, this graph, real, I'll start to kind of go a little bit more quickly here. Um, uh, again, the red is for P 
pure infrastructure, again, this is really mainly intended to be an infrastructure uh, project to help build those big stormwater capture projects. There's a little bit of pot of money. Uh, the green is the 5% um, of the 50% uh, that's being allotted for uh, studies, monitoring, uh, water quality modeling, and also technical assistance. Uh, no less than 1% 1 1 is being set aside for uh, technical assistance and is really to do feasibility studies like soils testing and um, hydrology testing to get uh, project concepts up to the point where they can compete for the red pot. And uh, these are just pictures of the different types of projects uh, that are meant to be built with this, um, this program. Uh, big galleries, green streets, um, even treat and release uh, facilities like the picture on the right. Um, and I'll just start breezing through. These next slides go a little bit into detail, and um, I didn't really want to get uh, to the detail, but I just wanted to show that there is a process for how the projects will be selected. There's a scoring criteria. There will be technical vetting uh, that is done. Uh, there's going to be a regional oversight committee that, again, is made up of um, various uh, stakeholders from each of the different watershed committees as well as agencies and uh, community group um, representatives. And then their board of supervisors will ultimately be the one to approve the suite of projects that are recommended for the regional project, for the regional program. Um, here's, these are a few graphs on membership. Um, this is again really small. This is meant to show the uh, we've already um, sort of pre-populated what the membership of each of the watershed groups will be, and it's, I know it's hard to see, but the membership, uh, uh, potential membership for the Lower LA and Lower San Gabriel are listed, that's the second and the third uh, rows there, um, and that's where um, uh, of the uh, 15 seats on the watershed steering committees, uh, six of those will be given to cities, and the cities will uh, have an opportunity there to um, to represent or sit on those uh, six seats for municipalities. Um, this is the membership of the oversight committee. It basically mirrors uh, the same type of makeup as the watershed steering committees, uh, except for the the blue, which was the municipal seats in the watershed committees. Uh, this will be a member from each of the nine committees um, or watershed area groups. Um, uh, one will be proposed to sit on this oversight committee. And then the, the green and the, and the yellow are again the agency and the community stakeholders. Um, and then finally, uh, this um, last pot for the district program, this is 10% uh, of the pot or about $30 million will go back to the LA County Flood Control District. Uh, and it's meant to um, really fund uh, not only overseeing uh, the management of the fund in terms of collecting uh, the tax and overseeing the distribution of funds to um, the various project uh, applicants, but it's also meant to fund uh, much more in terms of education programs and outreach. Uh, we really want to uh, do things like fund watershed coordinators and create training and um, certification classes to help build um, where it's, uh, we're using the term capacity building to really grow the knowledge of uh, stormwater issues um, in our communities at the level where maybe normally that type of education wouldn't, uh, wouldn't happen. Um, and so uh, I think this is the equity. Okay, so I, my last two final slides uh, are basically uh, a few slides on how we tried to um, incorporate equity into this program as well. Again, we saw the opportunity uh, to try and um, help underserved or disadvantaged communities that may not um, you know, have been underserved in the past. And so I think this is a little bit out of order. Let me see. Um, so with these bullets here, um, some of the ways we're trying to address it, and this throughout all three programs, is put elements in there that will help with um, local and targeted worker hire, um, uh, again, making sure that uh, we provide uh, not only the training, but that there are jobs waiting for those, um, uh, our workforce that, ha um, that have uh, gone through the effort of getting training for these, spe these types of um, projects. And uh, also in the regional program, um, there is a, a provision in there that 110% of the funds uh, raised in the regional program will be returned to disadvantaged communities. 
So uh, the benefit will still be a water quality benefit for the whole entire watershed area, but we're really trying to use this provision to push uh, those type of projects into disadvantaged communities. And then um, going back to my little graphic here, um, all of the uh, district programs on the, in the green, these were the education and stormwater education to build that knowledge and education in stormwater. The regional program is going to inject a little bit of money for technical feasibility, technical assistance, and the meshing of those two programs together will really help result in really a lot of good projects um, in our cities and in our disadvantaged communities to help get funding for projects in all three programs, the municipal, the regional, um, and then um, for both big and small projects. So um, I think that's it. Oh. Sorry about that. And uh, there's the, the website where a lot of the information um, and um, uh, the document is there, information about all the stakeholders meetings is there. And then uh, I think I can take some questions now, if possible, and, or questions? if you have any. Any questions for Viviana? I mean, Genevieve, <laughs> sorry, That's okay. changing your name. <laughs> Any questions? I do. Okay, Council Member Gillis. Um, the legislation that you're talking about going on the ballot in November, what is it, how does that read? Are they asking for a, a certain amount of tax? Or are they just saying the ability to tax? Or what are they asking for in that legislation? So right now the ballot um, language that proposed is to impose two and a half cents per square foot of impermeable area on each parcel. So the impermeable area um, is basically um, imp uh, surfaces that where stormwater runoff could not penetrate or go into the ground. So like concrete driveways, roofs, um, paved surfaces, basically. Okay. And um, do you know what the? And this is a little bit off subject, but my concern is obviously the inc you know increased taxes for the uh, community. Um, because with the two tunnels that are going to be built, we're also going to be paying more in taxes for that is in our water bill. I'm all about storm water runoff, but I just don't know what's the alternative if this legislation doesn't pass to getting this type of um, project going without having the taxpayers have to pay for it. What about the violators through the AQMD and through other, uh, you know, RECWA and all these other water resources instead of taxing the per the people, why not tax the violators and, and can we still get these projects done if this tax doesn't pass? Sure, so, um, so right now uh, with the mention of the Clean Water Act, there's a, a permit, an NPDES permit called the MS4 permit that uh, all of the cities, including the county and incorporated area, are subject to, uh, um, to to meet in order to meet the water quality regulations that we have right now. And so the funding for that is what is lacking. And so without this um, proposed funding, a lot of our cities and agencies are having to um, uh, compete with other priorities um, and get funding for it with the general fund. So the projects right now that are happening, a lot of them are having to depend on grant funding um, or, or cost shares with um, other agencies. Um, it's, really, it's really difficult, so the intent for this um, proposed measure that's go that is potentially going to go on this November is to help provide a, a a reliable source of funding so that those projects and programs can be have reliable consistent funding every year and um, and hopefully not have to compete with some of the other priorities uh, that cities have to face. I understand it's just an easier way to go to tax the, the people as opposed to uh, being aggressive and trying to go after those other grants. I just feel that before we put this into legislation the way that it is that we try to do something else prior to that. Yeah. This is an easy way to go, but who's paying for it? That's my concern. I understand. Yes, noted. Thank you. Okay. okay, item seven, all report. May I have a staff report on the home security rebate program, please? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor and Council. Uh, as you know, public safety has always been a priority of the City Council, and as such, over the years, we've offered programs to residents that help us to, to fight crime. Uh, you may recall last month the City Council authorized staff to change the parameters of the Scarecrow Commercial Security System program. Now as a pilot program, we now allow for rebates to residents who install a security device around their homes. And again, this is a pilot program. 
We've, we, we launched the program and it's been very well received in the community. So tonight, <clears throat> excuse me, we just wanted to give you some details about the program and show you a step by step how a resident would go about applying for a rebate. And with that, I'll turn it over to our public safety director, Ms. Adriana Lopez. Adriana? Thank you, John. Um, good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members, once again. This evening, I will be providing a update on our new pilot program, which is known as the Home Security Rebate Program. As John mentioned, on April 17th, the City Council approved this pilot program, which was known as the Scarecrow Program. And some of the changes were focused on giving residents some type of security measure around their property. The new program would provide a rebate up to $200 for Paramount residents who install products that are mentioned here, like an alarm system, a security camera system, a doorbell camera, also known as a ring, or properly known as a ring, and also exterior floodlights with a camera or motion sensor lights <clears throat> with a camera. Products that are similar to that as well. Here are some images of the products that we just discussed. So for a resident to qualify, they must be a Paramount resident. They must be a new customer of a security camera or a security company or have purchased the new security product within 60 days. And the products must fall into the category that we just previously mentioned. Lastly, the applicant must complete an online application and submit a receipt within 60 days of the purchase date. The rebate will be one per household and it would be a first come first serve basis. So how does a resident apply? As mentioned, they would have to go online by visiting ParamountCity.com. They would have to upload the required document, which would be a receipt of the product and also a picture of the product that was installed. Once they do that, the information will be reviewed by public safety personnel. And if they meet the eligibility requirements, then a rebate will be issued to the Paramount resident. What I'll do right now is um, just explain how we were able to do this. Through the help of CityGrow, we are able to provide an easy to use online application for Paramount residents to use if they wish to complete this program. So with that, we're gonna go live. Okay, so when a resident logs on to our city website, as you can see here, this is the part where they would outline the programs or the eligibility requirements. And at the bottom, we took into consideration that some people may not feel comfortable using the online. So what we did is we provided information that if they needed help, or they had limited access to a computer to contact one of our city personnel, Anthony Martinez, who's our crime analyst. And we will click on to the application. So this is the first part of the program, which would be the program guidelines. And so the applicant would click on to that. They would click get started, provide an email, So this is a way of communicating with our city personnel as well. If they have any questions or if they have any issues, they can go ahead and, and send an email and create your password. <clears throat> Some people might launch this and then realize they can't complete it, so they would create an account and a password and they can go ahead and finish the process at a later date. It looks like maybe Anthony forgot his password here. <laughs> okay, so if we can't get through this, then we'll go ahead and, okay. All right, let's try this one more time. What we did notice is that if people are using the website from their work computer, there are a lot of filters, and so we did get some phone calls saying that they were having trouble with that. What we suggested is that they use their home computer because a lot of the times their work computer will have a very sensitive filter or barracuda that won't allow them to log in. 
we'll go ahead and see if okay so he's changing his password here and if we can't get a new password then we'll go ahead and go on to the next step okay so it looks like he's back on so what happens is when an applicant will submit the initial information they will go ahead and receive an email okay so here we go so what happens is number one let me see if I can see this number one would be the program guidelines so the applicant will be able to read everything that they have to do in order to submit their rebate once they look at these eligibility requirements and they feel they meet the eligibility requirements, they go to the application form. So if we can go to step two. Okay, so here, this is where the applicants ask to submit their information. So some of these are optional and some of them you obviously, they're required, you're required to give your name and your address. Okay, and then this will be geocoded and I don't think it's showing here okay Anthony if you can put 16400 and maybe that will reset instead of 16 yeah <clears throat> if not that's okay we'll go on to the next step so you have all this optional information that's just for us to keep track of where some of these products are being installed but if you can go up a little bit you went too fast Anthony go back down okay so here we would ask the applicant to tell us what they installed so as you can see they installed a video doorbell and how much did you spend two hundred dollars okay so then they submit all that information and then we're going to ask them to submit a photo or upload a photo okay if you could do that okay and now if we can go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so then what happens is, is once you submit all that information, the resident will receive an email confirmation saying that you submitted your application and now it's being reviewed. So that the resident doesn't feel like what happened, I submitted all this information and I don't know what the next step is. So once the application gets approved, they'll get a second email saying, congratulations, your rebate, has, your rebate application has been approved, and you'll receive another email saying that your check is now ready for pickup. Once the check has been issued, the third and final email will let the resident know that their check is ready for pickup at the Paramount Station. Once the resident picks up their check at the station, they will be asked to sign a form stating that all the information that they gave us was true and they're not just making false information to get the rebate. So since the uh, launch of this home security program, which just started in May, of, uh, May 1st, we've had five residents who actually mm -hmm. completed the whole process and we are processing their rebate. Some of them, it wasn't $200. Some of them were a little bit less, $150. But for the most part, it's been $200. So currently in our fiscal year, we have budgeted for 25 of these rebates. It could be a little bit more based on if everybody um, gets a little bit less than $200. So not every rebate is going to be $200. There is a placeholder for this program in our upcoming fiscal year 2019. Mm -hmm in the budget and with the approval of city council, we anticipate increasing the amount for this program. We were able to get a testimony from our first resident who completed the program. And as you can see, this is a very cute picture. Mm -hmm. uh, they included their daughter with their new product. <laughs> so it says, we currently discovered that the city was offering rebates to families who purchase security devices or alarms for their homes in an effort to deter criminal activity in our community. This was something we had already considered, but we were budgeting before making the purchase. Having these types of rebates will help Paramount residents secure their homes with little to no cost at all. 
Thanks for the rebate, we were able to purchase our security device that will allow us to feel safer in our own home. We are very great, thankful for helping us make the city of Paramount a safer place and giving us the opportunity to share our gratitude for the gesture to the community. So once again, this was the first family to receive a rebate and the Olivas family who lives obviously in the city of Paramount. Very nice. <laughs> and this concludes my presentation. Very nice. Uh, Adriana, any questions? Okay, very good. Thank you, Adriana. You're welcome. Okay, um, are there any comments <coughs> or um, from council members? Madam Mayor, if I may, um, I would just like to um, <coughs> say that um, the, the metro meeting that we had here um, over at Progress Park was very well attended by the Paramount residents. There's a lot of information that people need to get about. Um, how this could uh, affect their homes depending on the area that they live in. And um, I'm also pleased to report that I met with Assemblyman Rondon to um, express the concerns he was part of securing um, the financing for the Metro Rail, and he was very interested to know how it would impact the residents of Paramount and um, is going to be looking into those areas. So please um, feel free to contact Metro, contact the city, of, uh, about any issues that we may not be aware of as we watch this process and try to mitigate um, anything that may happen with our residents. Also, I wanted to just tell David um, the banner program. You did it beautifully, you did it bigger, you did it better. And so um, I think it's gonna be absolutely um, outstanding for those kids and their families and friends to drive down the boulevard, see their photos, see the colleges they're go to and um, really um, help raise um, the visualness of, of the importance of education in our city. So thank you, David, great job. And then lastly, I, if I could just say, Chris, I'm really gonna miss you. I have to tell you, uh, for all the years you've been here, a lot of times you don't get to hear outsiders. Um, you just you know hear what's um, happening in your own community, but when I attended that um, stormwater runoff meeting and everybody around the table was deferring to you, and saying, oh, you know, talk to Chris Cash, talk to the public works director in Paramount. He understands it all, he gets it all, and telling us how blessed we were to have you and all of your knowledge. And I feel really cheated because I just found out how great you are and you're leaving. Aww. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for all of your years and your dedication and the expertise that you brought to our city. Thank you, Madam Mayor. You're welcome. Any other council members? No, I do I, I have council a Council Member Gillen. Um, I agree with everything Peggy said, believe it or not. Um, but I wanted to mention that I had told, asked John um, if he knew if there was going to be a time for the Metro where they would have a question and uh, answer comment session or question and answer session. Um, I'm getting a lot of emails that I had expressed to John that people have a lot of questions. And so if Metro's not going to do it, I was wondering if perhaps maybe we could um, have a little section on the website where people could ask questions and they could be addressed back by city staff. Um, a lot of people are concerned about sound walls. Somebody was told that if they wanted a sound wall from Metro that the city of Paramount was going to be the ones to have to pay for it. So whether it's true, whether it's not true, but just to answer those types of questions. And then someone was here tonight that had some questions, but there's a meeting tonight at Paramount Park in regard or, or Downey, sorry, um, in regards to the Metro. And then I just wanted to mention that Diane and I went to on saturday we both attended um, a kickoff for a field office here in paramount for antonio via rigoso rigosa whether you like them whether you don't like them it's kind of cool that there's something like that someone running for governor and there's a, a field headquarters here in paramount to stop by and check it out um and that's it thank you as mayor i'd like to appoint i'm sorry I'm sorry, go ahead. Mike, let me make a little report about the Vector Control Board meeting last week. Uh, they're expecting <coughs> probably a large influx of mosquitoes this year. They've already had, I believe it was one mm -hmm. tested positive about a month ago for West Nile, uh, north of here. And they're in the process now of actually hiring seasonal employees. They, we have to do that every year to help out with taking care of the mosquitoes and so on that uh, are around. They have, in fact, some storm drains. They've worked on some of those things too already, and they're clearing out some of the channels where 
they really have a problem. And actually, a lot of people don't know, but you can standing water around your neighborhood or your house is not a good thing because they will breed there. And they say that as little as like a, a bottle cap full of water, you can have a bunch of mosquitoes just from that alone. So you have to watch out for those kind of things because it, they're expecting a fairly active year this year. Four months ago, my um, um, uncle got breast Nile, and he resides in Bellflower, and he was in the hospital for four to six months a couple months ago, so it's scary. Um, as mayor, I would like to appoint um, Daryl Hoffmeyer as the alternate representative to the county sanitation district. Um, this past Friday, I attended Congresswoman Lucille Roybal's um, art awards, and I don't know how many applicants um, uh, presented their art um, works to her office, but there were five finalists, and there were two um, from Paramount High School, one from City, from Downey Unified, um, one from Bell, and one from Maya Angelou Academy, and. Um, Third place was one of was uh, from Paramount High School, Susanna Munoz. She came in third place with her art piece um, called Mother Nature, and then first place was from Paramount High School, and it was presented to Noah Endo, and his piece was titled A <coughs> Growing Threat, and Noah will receive one thousand dollars scholarship. $200 for art supplies and a trip to Washington, D.C. And Noah will have his art piece displayed in the United States Capitol for one year. So in the future, um, I'd like to bring um, both of these um, Paramount High School students to a council meeting to honor them. So um, it was Congresswoman Roy Ball's 25th um, Arts Awards, and it was excellent. It was so nice to see so many painting and artwork. So. Okay, um, any comments from city staff? Uh, yes, Madam, and just uh, thank you for your patience as we're going through the, the minor tweaks on the audio visual. I know some of the mics were a little more sensitive, so we're working that out now that we have individual control of the mics. We're, thank you, Jonathan. You're doing a good job back there in his new spot. He's, he used to be up by where Lana is, so um, he's definitely doing a, a really good work at trying to, trying to keep us here. So just that's it. Thank you. I have one other thing, too, for Chris, too, because I definitely will miss Chris. He's kept me in line with CWAC, that's the Southeast Water Coalition, that we have a meeting every other month on that, and he clues me in as to what I need to look for and that kind of stuff, too, and also the new energy thing, too, so I definitely miss you, Chris, and thank you for all your help. I appreciate it. And I also would like to state a few words about Chris. Um, you will always be part of our city family, so please come by and visit. <coughs> And I just wish you much luck, and God bless you and your family always in your new endeavor. And so at this time, I am going to adjourn this meeting in a wonderful public works director, Chris Cash. Great.